we are, we are an organization that uh, we have been uh, assisting uh, newly arrived refugee claimants and precarious migrants for 31 years. We were founded by uh, two former refugees from El Salvador, um, Loli Rico uh, are, and our late uh, co-director Francisco Rico Martinez. They were fleeing the war in El Salvador. And when they arrived um, as a government assisted refugees, they saw the need for refugee claimants. Then they started with one house hosting um, at that time, uh, women from Ethiopia and then uh, now we have four houses and we host uh, women and children uh, with non-status, uh, fleeing domestic violence or doing the refugee claim in Canada. We have uh, like the main, the main uh, four programs. We have settlement and integration. Um, we have the immigration support. Um, that is the, is the area that we are going to focus today. We have the anti-trafficking team and uh, we have the migrant workers mobile. Um, we focus on the anti-trafficking labor exploitation because we have been seeing the increase of um, labor exploitation. And we have been uh, found many people. Um, sometimes we see 30, 40 migrant workers, um, some of them refugee claimants that are waiting for the refugee, uh, for the work permit, uh, being uh, living in a house, being forced to work uh, for sometimes even $18 didn't know the, the rights and being threatened. And that um, had been a trend for the last three years. Then our organization really tried to uh, provide information to migrant workers that they have labor rights, even though some of them will not have a uh, status in Canada. And also we had the public education and networking and all these uh, webinars and um, trainings that we provide to refugee claimants and non-status um, is part of that. Then um, um, we, we can see that uh, refugee claimants are part of the, uh, the precarious population um, because if a refugee claimant is found to be, for example, um, with uh, criminal charges that are minimum six months, they can be uh, removed from the country. Uh, many of them are part of the uh, failed refugee claimants. Uh, some of them, the IRB will say, I will believe your case, but you have an internal flight and we believe you can be uh, secure uh, in another part of the country. Then unfortunately, many of them uh, among the um, survivors or gender-based violence that they said, I will not going back. Um, I will remain out of status. Um, we had many visitors that they arrive uh, looking for better life. Uh, they, uh, when they arrive, they can stay a maximum three, uh, six months. If they don't get um, a document that says you need to leave in two weeks or so in three months. Um, now, uh, before when people were arriving, they were getting like a kind of a stamp of the passport. That's not happening anymore. If a person is, is receiving um, uh, that they need to leave the country before six months, they will get an official document saying that. But if they don't get nothing, then um, and they for sure they will not get a stamp, they can stay up to six months. And we see that many people now is arriving um, without um, like a visa is because they can apply to the uh, ETA, Electronic Travel Authorization. Among them, many people from European countries and uh, people from Mexico. It's just an electronic document. They pay $30, $40, and um, they don't need to prove that they had money to come. They don't need to prove anything. 
and that's how they they are arriving and you you probably you are going to to see the passport they don't have a visa because the electronic travel authorization is just um an, an electronic application also we see a lot of breakdown for a sponsorship um and um Many of the survivors are uh, or visitors, international students, or uh, without status that uh, the partner promised them to, to sponsor. Then they become non-status. Then I'm going to talk about the refugee process overview. Um, in Canada, um, when you arrive into the country and you arrive as a visitor or international student, uh, but uh, the main objective for them was um, coming to Canada seeking protection, um, then uh, when they arrive, um, some of them are scared to claim protection uh, at the port of entry. Uh, most of them arrived to in Ontario to Pearson Airport, and um, they just arrived as a visitors. They came into the country. Then they are called inland refugee claimants. Um, unfortunately, this is affecting them because when you arrive as a visitor, and most of them come to the here at the center, even the same day or a week or two weeks later. Um, saying what I want is to claim protection. I didn't know that I couldn't do it at the airport or if I knew it, I was scared. Um, remember many of them are fleeing persecution sometimes from authorities and um, they don't trust. And you see at the airport when they claim protection, what they see is a, a CBSA officer. Um, that looks like a, a policeman, then um, th they are scared and, or they don't know that they could do it. But this caused many problems because right now uh, to have a lawyer that will process the, the inland claim is taking between two to three months. Uh, during this time, the um, inland claim they don't have access to anything. They don't have access to the Interal Federal Health Program. Um, they will not have um, access to Ontario Works, like social assistance. Um, the only thing that they can apply is to legal aid if, they, if financially they are um, accepted through legal aid to get a lawyer to start the process. But again, a lot of lawyers um, these days, they are not taking inland claims through legal aid because legal aid will only pay the lawyer seven hours. Um, and they are taking more than seven hours because the new portal um, that um, IRCC, Immigration and Refugee Citizenship, um, is asking the lawyers to do it. Um, before, when you were doing an inland claim, you were filling out some forms, the basis of claim, that is the narrative. And the refugee claimant were going in person to the 5343 Dantas Street, close to the airport. But this office had been closed since uh, the pandemic, March 2020, and uh, IRCC moved to do a virtual portal. Then, um, now the portal is more friendly user, but when they uh, did it in 2021, was a lot of problems. And it's still, uh, then uh, refugee lawyers are spending a lot of time filling out the portal. And um, we have been losing some really good lawyers that they don't want to take any more inland claims uh, through legal aid. The second is, um, the refugee claim process for port of entry. Is there a question? No? Okay. Um, yes? No? Okay. The, the port of entry, um, um, then when they arrive to the airport, they uh, claim protection right away or they arrive, the most popular uh, border port of entry is at uh, Peace Bridge in Fort Erie. 
The other one is in um, La Col in Quebec. Um, all the main airports. Um, when they get there, um, they get interviewed by a CBSA officer, Canadian Border Services office officer, and um, they do the claim there, and um, they will get uh, some documents um, and some forms that they needed to fill it out. Um, but one thing that is affecting um, making a claim at the port of entry is the um, Canada and United States signed a an, uh, an safety country agreement since 2004. Uh, this is preventing people coming to uh, official port of entry to claim protection from the United States if they don't meet uh, some exemptions. Uh, the exceptions are um, if they have close family members and uh, who can qualify a, a family member, spouse, uh, children, uncle, aunt, nephew, and niece. And they need to prove that they have a status in Canada. Um, or if there are uh, unaccompanied minors um, or if they have uh, a document holder exception, like those that uh, apply to the ETA, the Electronic Travel Authorization, they can cross the border, um, or if they can prove that if they are sending back home, they will face the death penalty. With the close family members, is the more exception that people use, um, but recently there have been some issues because, for example, if my partner is trying to cross, but we are not legally married, we used to live in common law back home, and we don't have any evidence of that, uh, sometimes the CBSA officer will not believe the relationship, that then if I cannot prove that we have a relationship, I will not be considered as an anchor. Then uh, my partner can be refused. It means that the person it will be returned, sent back to United States. If the person is likely to be entered United States with a, a, a visa, um, visitor visa or any other kind of permit, they will be let it go. But if the person had been returned uh, and they uh, entered before irregularly through United States, they will be detained. Unfortunately, during the pandemic, many people didn't knew about this and also the border was closed. And we have um, we had known that uh, around 20, especially uh, single men were returned back and they spent almost two years in detention in the United States. Um, also, another thing that is affecting refugee claimants that are coming uh, to claim protection in Canada is what we call the five eyes in eligibility. This was introduced kind of in 2020. Uh, it means that uh, any refugee claimant or asylum seeker that uh, start a refugee process in US, UK, New Zealand, or Australia, um, they cannot claim protection in Canada. Um, and there is a lot of confusion, especially through refugee claimants that are coming uh, from uh, crossing the border, um, for, for example, from Texas. Uh, we have refugee claimants, uh, for example, from uh, Niger Nigeria or um, Haiti, that um, they come all the way, they landed in Brazil and they come up all the way to uh, Mexico. Um, and um, they, uh, when they entered the United States, they had been detained. And um, sometimes they don't know if they start the refugee claim process because the legislation there for uh, those that are uh, um, looking for asylum protection at the States, they, they call it now uh, a quick interview. Uh, then the only way that in Canada um, we know if they did or started or not the, the refugee process is through the biometrics. Then, um, 
many people that arrive through the, and if they meet the, the safety country exemption, they will let come into Canada. And if they found out that, uh, through the biometrics that they, uh, they start the process in the United States, they will let them in, but they will be provided with something that is called the en enhanced uh, the new pre-removal risk assessment. Um, what is the difference? A refugee claimant, when they go to the eligibility interview, they go to the refugee ID, the case is referred to the Immigration and Refugee Board, the IRB. But if you are found to be ineligible because you started a claim or you were rejected in one of these five countries, then your case will be decided by a, an immigration uh, officer. They will stay with IRCC. They will have an interview um, and they have access to legal aid counsel. Um, they need to send evidence, um, but the case is not going to be referred to the Immigration and Refugee Board. Um, also, they will have access to um, the Interim Federal Health uh, Program. They will have access to legal aid, uh, but uh, unfortunately, they need to pay for the work permit uh, that it cost to them 255. And also, recently, we have been seeing that uh, those that uh, got the pre removal assessment, uh, the enhanced uh, PRA, they have been uh, denied access to social assistance Ontario works. But they get a kind of, um, um, the, you can see the refugee ID looks like the same. It's just in the small print. It will say you, are in, you were found to be ineligible and then your case is going to be with the new PRA. Also, uh, what we are seeing uh, for those that are coming through um, La Colle in Quebec, um, or uh, unfortunately, many people, they don't meet the exemptions for the safety country agreement, then what they are doing is entering Canada through irregular uh, ways. Um, they just cross, uh, through, from United States to Quebec. They are detained by the RCMP, but they are allowed to claim protection. Um, then they don't go to the, uh, for example, a call that is an official port of entry. They just came through um, any road. Uh, there is a famous road in Quebec that they are crossing and they are detained and um, we have been seeing, there are reports that around uh, 100 re uh, refugee claimants cross irregularly, uh, mostly every day through, um, through uh, Quebec. Then um, right now, anyone who is crossing through Quebec, uh, even uh, from La Corte, the official port of entry or irregularly, the eligibility interview for them to get the uh, refugee ID right now is going to be until uh, March 2024. Then uh, the Quebec government had been uh, requesting that. Could I, could I just, could I, I'm sorry, could I just yeah. you to repeat that again? The uh, yeah. uh, About the March 2024. Uh, oh, yes. What, Those that are coming to Quebec, um, the eligibility interview. Um, okay, when you claim protection at the border, um, before the pandemic, you were getting right away the eligibility interview, you refugee ID. But what is happening now is that they just, just get a document uh, known as the acknowledgement document. I'm going to uh, show you that document in another slide. And they are going to provide it with forms. Then after that, they need to go for uh, the eligibility interview. And when they get the eligibility interview, they will get the refugee ID. And when they get the refugee ID, they will be uh, provided the work permit. Right now, the eligibility interview for those entering in Quebec, regular or irregularly, uh, the eligibility is uh, now 
if you enter today, probably it's going to be for April or May 2024. Uh, then, um, and those that are entering here through the Pearson Airport, they don't get a date. We don't know when it's going to happen. Then um, the Quebec government had been saying, we cannot have all these refugee claimants in Quebec with our permit. Then um, CBSA and IRCC launched that, that what is called One Touch Pilot Program. And they said, if it works, they will extend it to uh, the other regions. And um, if, if the refugee claimant uh, come, Right away, they will uh, do a uh, like a pre eligibility interview, and they will get the um, the refugee ID right away. Um, and we have been seeing this for the last three 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 weeks. Then um, I, I was uh, saying that uh, now the, the portal to apply for, for the refugee process is called the e-app. And um, sometimes our organization assists some refugee claimants to do it because the lawyer is saying, I cannot uh, spend time doing this. I will only do the basis of claim. It takes a long time. Then um, the, everything now is online. Um, oh, I had this again. Then um, this is how um, we assisted people to apply for legal aid um, because we see uh, some refugee claimants that unfortunately they don't know that they can get legal aid and they get a lawyer what immigration consultant, they paid uh, the few savings that they bring into the country um, and it's too late sometimes when they find out that they can apply to legal aid. Um, then um, also this is, I have been referring to the basis of claim. Um, when, when you claim protection inside, then the lawyer will fill out the force for you and they will put it in the portal. But also they need to fill out what is called the basis of claim, the narrative. Um, and it's really important that also the forms and the, the basis of claim are reviewed by the lawyer because it can bring some credibility issues. For example, in the basis of claim, the refugee claimant can say, um, I was working in this city and something happened to me here. But if in one of the forms that is called Schedule 8, where the government is asking them to provide uh, the last 10 years um, information, what they have been doing. If in the Schedule 8 they said, didn't mention that they were working in that city, it can be, bring credibility issues. Or that they were hiding. And in the, in the, when they report the address, they don't mention those places. Then that's why we are calling legal aid also uh, to increase uh, the hours for, re for refugee lawyers that they can spend the amount of time necessary to make sure that in the future refugee claimants will not face credibility. Because CBSA Canadian Border Services is asking refugee claimants to fill out the forms in, uh, in two weeks or 30 days. And uh, many people uh, wanted to do it because the lawyers are saying, I cannot do it in two weeks. I will ask for an extension of time, but I cannot do it. Then they are filling out these things by themselves. Also, if you visit our website, you can um, see and, and you can use this to provide to uh, a refugee claimant to see how they can fill out the basis of claim. Uh, this is not for them to fill it uh, by them, but what we try to do is that they understand um, what are the minimum requirements that they need to provide for the basis of claim that because we see that uh, sometimes they unfortunately go to like what is called a ghost consultant um, that they are no official registered with the college of I I immigration consultants and they put wherever they want them then what we want is the refugee claimants to empower them knowing 
if what that person is doing there is, is correct and that they can uh, then um, apply to legal aid if the, the basis of claim was figured out by somebody that was no training to do it. Um, this is the new uh, refugee protection claim um, that I was mentioning. Um, then right now, those that are entering through, through Quebec are getting this refugee protection claim. No everybody is getting it because if uh, the refugee claimant have any criminal issues and sometimes they have been detained, they will not get this. But those that are, um, that they get the pre-eligibility interview there at the border, they will get it. But what those that are coming through Pearson Airport, they are not getting this document. Unfortunately, what they are getting is this, that what is called acknowledgement of claim and notice to return for an interview. You see that there is no picture here. Um, then uh, many of many of refugee claimants were facing a lot of um, uh, problems, even open a bank account because the banks were saying this is no official document. I can open it with you. Yeah, and we have been telling refugee claimants when you go with this document, um, try to get uh, when you claim protection. The ID that you presented, most of them, the ID that they presented is the passport, was taken away. But they had been provided with a certified copy of the passport of any ID that they presented to claim protection. Uh, with those documents, uh, we had to intervene sometimes with the bank telling them this is an official document. Uh, to get a refugee ID, probably it's going to be six, seven months, one year. Um, and also they are getting this document saying that they need to fill out all these forms. And you see here, they are saying within 30 days. Um, we have been seeing other instructions for people that arrive through Quebec saying two weeks. Also, um, in during like summer, July uh, and uh, August, September, there was there were a crisis in Quebec. The hotels, uh, everything was full. Then the Quebec uh, uh, IRCC had to uh, start uh, moving refugee claimants to uh, to Ottawa, to Cornwall, and in Niagara. Um, and they were placed in hotels and there were a lot of confusion um, because some people will get 30 days, some people will get two weeks and it was really hard for them to be in a hotel to have access to legal aid. Um, after that, uh, some local organizations that didn't have uh, the experience working with refugee claimants started supporting them but it caused a lot of uh, stress to refugee claimants that uh, they said, I was in, 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 in Quebec in a hotel, they knocked my door and said, okay, we are taking you to a, a, another uh, town. And some of them ended in Cornwall. Then um, it, it was a, a really stressful time for them. Right, so Diana, I have another mm -hmm. question. Yes. Okay. So, so just so I understand, mm -hmm. Uh, so if we have clients that show up at our clinic with that document that you, that, yeah, yeah so this one, mm -hmm. we, we, this means that this client entered through Quebec and possibly had a criminal record in their home country or in Canada? No, no. Oh. Um, this document, um, anyone who entered to a uh, port of entry or they did an inland, they get this document. Okay. okay. Um, the, the, the program that is called uh, One Touch just started uh, um, a few weeks ago um, in Quebec. Uh, but from uh, since 2020, uh, middle of 2020, refugee claimants had been getting this. And even if you claim protection inland, they will get the acknowledgement of claim. 
Okay. In land and port of entry, they get this. Uh, but from, I will say the US starts seeing people now coming from uh, Quebec. Um, um, sometimes uh, then, yes, probably they have a criminal record, but also they will have um, order to, to report to CVSA um, once a month. Yeah, they have complications and some of them have been in detention. We have been seeing many um, claimants uh, detained uh, in Quebec, but not because they have a criminal background. They have been detained because they, can, they don't have a valid ID. Mm. Um, and they have been detained until they produce a valid ID. Um, yeah. And valid ID meaning ID from their home country? Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And so um, sometimes even they, they are able to contact family back home, even if they send a picture of the passport or a birth certificate with that they will be able uh, to uh, be released from detention. Yeah, we have many Venezuelans that are uh, coming, walking from Colombia, uh, many very young guys, and they have been in detention because they lost all the IDs um, crossing from um, uh, all the way up to, to Canada. And they have been detained until they produce an ID, unfortunately. Um, then um, we have um, a program here at FCJ um, that is called the Refugee Hearing Orientations. And um, it, this is a really, really nice opportunity for uh, refugee claimants that are very anxious about, um, I, I know some really good lawyers will provide a lot of time to prepare them for the hearing. Some of them will rush um, the preparation, uh, but even if they have a good lawyer that have been preparing them, asking them for evidence, um, it's really good to have uh, the refugee claimants to attend these uh, hearing orientations. Um, they have been saying um, after I attended and it's virtual and uh, we, um, the ready to provide uh, interpretation then they said they feel more secure because the, the board member that they that provide orientation will know answer uh, particular questions about the cases. But in general, they provide good orientation. If like, for example, if you are during the hearing, you don't understand the interpreter, feel free to let us know. Don't, don't be scared that that is going to affect your case. Things like that, giving them tips how they should uh, behave during the, the, the hearing, what are the rights, what are the things that they can say during the hearing. Then um, we have, you, you see that we already have for January, February and March, and also we have for, for the appeal. For those that unfortunately uh, get rejected, they can do also do appeals orientations. And um, th this is a, also a great tool um for refugee claimants to to get more to empower them to to take more on their hands um sometimes to understand how is the process in canada and we see the level of anxiety be reduced when when they uh, get to these these hidden orientations also um it's really important uh we do webinars with them um, uh, because again, there is a great lodgers that spend a lot of time. There are some lodgers that they don't, but even if they have a good lodger that have been preparing them, we try to, to talk to them, to prepare them um, because they, they said, okay, what um, they are looking then uh, when we explained about identity, we have some cases, I'm, I'm, I was saying that many people get detained because they cannot produce an identity document. When you flee from your country, sometimes they need to use uh, 
uh, fraud passport because the government is looking for you. Then the only way to exit is using other identity. But if you cannot produce your uh, identity document proving I'm from this country, the uh, your case cannot be moved to other issues like credibility of what happened to you. Because if I cannot not prove that I'm from this country and this happened to me, and we have cases that uh, they cannot prove that they are from, um, especially with countries from Africa, um, or that they are from a certain uh, group of tribe. Uh, they have been um, refused because of this. Um, how many, how you can um, prove uh, your identity, you cannot get, um, an ID. Uh, we have many people that uh, flee from a small town and everything was pulled down. They cannot get any identity. Um, um, you can get like an affidavit from somebody in the community. Um, also, sometimes I said, if you have somebody from your community that is seeking asylum in Europe, in another country, that they can do um, a sort document saying we were living in the same village. We go together to a school. Um, that's how sometimes they uh, overcome the identity barrier. Another big theme is the credibility, and we are really worried right now because I was telling you that uh, CVSA and IRCC are rushing refugee claimants to do the forms, telling them if you do the forms, your eligibility interview is going to be uh, sooner than later. And we don't know if that's going to happen because um, there are a lot of people claiming protection in Canada right now and they don't have the capacity to see everybody. Um, then I see clients that are filling out the force by themselves and um, that can bring credibility issues. Um, also, um, they, they are using the internal fry alternative to refuse people. Uh, what this mean? They said, I can believe you, um, but also uh, you can be safe in another part of the country. Uh, for example, we have, when it is a big country, for example, Mexico, they will say, I'm really sorry what happened to you, but I think you have uh, internal flight. For example, they use a lot of Merida. Uh, we don't think so that this person or this group can find you in Merida and that you can be safe there. That's the internal flight. Um, and many people, unfortunately, they don't know. Um, I, when they come here and we do the intake, we said, did you move internally before coming to Canada? And so people, I said, look, if you were a, um, a journalist, you um, denounce corruption. You are going to be a journalist and you are going to be this kind of work in any part of the country, then you are going, you don't have an internal flight because they can find you anywhere because who you are. But if you are just X person, and um, sometimes I see, for example, they said I was working in a bank and I get threats if I didn't disclose the list of clients in, in the bank. Um, no, I didn't move anywhere. I just came to Canada. Sometimes they are refused because they said, look, you could ask your bank to move you to another region. You could quit your job. And then this person didn't need to uh, look for you any longer. And you could be safe in another part. Then we see a lot of refusals because the internal flight. Um, also the generalized risk. Um, many uh, people cannot prove um, this is happening to everybody or this is just happening to me. Um, and also the state of protection. Did they access to the state of protection? They, if something happened to them, they went to the authorities, they went to the police. But right now um, there, uh, there are uh, many reports um, that um, the lawyer can access. And for, for example, there are some countries, if you go to the police, the police unfortunately had been infiltrated by the gangs 
or by the mafia, then you know that if you go to the police, you're going to be more at risk. You're going to put yourself more at risk. Then um, sometimes the state of protection uh, with uh, human rights reports, um, those can be um, proof that the person couldn't access to state of protection. Sometimes cases of gender-based violence, um, they said, um, oh, there are beautiful written laws in your country. You didn't access the state of protection. There is shelters uh, protecting survivors of gender-based violence and you didn't access to them. Um, in those cases, sometimes it's really hard to, uh, to prove that they, they uh, couldn't do it. Uh, sometimes um, uh, it's, it's, it's really hard when a survivor of gender-based violence is, is rejected and they said, I really, really be scared to go back home, even though they are saying that uh, in my country, they will protect me. Um, um, also, there is um, the, the, the national package documentation. Um, sometimes I tell the clients to go there and look for this national documentation package um, because they can see um, how Canada is seen like the case. For example, if I am a human rights defender from a certain country, um, what they see, if there is reports there that human rights defenders have been targeted in the country. Uh, and I said, this part, the lawyer will do it for you. But what I want is them to understand how Canada see the issue. If I'm fleeing um, um, violence from a gang saying they want to recruit my children, is there any document there? Uh, can I have um, a expert witness, uh, somebody from that is an academic and that they had been doing reports about this? Um, so, that's what we suggested to the refugee claimants, trying to understand how Canada, eh, what documents or how Canada have information about the issues that they are facing back home, that they can discuss with the, with the lawyer. Um, then um, when the refugee claimant goes to the hearing, um, unfortunately right now, um, people after they get the eligibility interview, that they get the refugee ID, then the case is moved to the IRB, is referred to the IRB, Immigration and Refugee Board. But we have cases, unfortunately, they wait six months or they wait one year, two years, three years to get a date for a hearing with the IRB and with the Refugee Protection Division. Um, and probably in your practice, you see how these uh, affect uh, refugee claimants because it's kind of the lives are on hold, uh, waiting. They don't know they are going to say yes to me or no. Also family reunification. Until they get protection status, they cannot get um, um, to apply for, for the family members back home. Then um, if they get accepted, they can apply for the permanent resident application. Then they can um, apply for the dependents um, if the dependents are uh, back home. But also we what we are seeing now for family reunification is also waiting long periods. For example, if tomorrow I will get a refugee claimant that got protected person status or convention refugee status, we send the application. The application right now with IRCC to get a permanent residency as a protected person is taking 24 months. Then if as a refugee claimant, I have been waiting for three years. Now I need to add another two years to be lucky to get my family in Canada. Then. Family separation is another big, big issue that uh, is bringing a lot of mental health problems to refugee claimants. Um, because it's like, um, I, for I escape as a mother, 
Uh, I was a human rights defender. And because my fault, my children, my partner is back home facing risk and I cannot do anything here. Then um, that's a lot, a lot to ask for a person. Uh, when we get a refugee claimant here and we are telling them, when I going to see my family, that's what we said. We are talking about between four to five years of family separation. And it's, that's, that's really hard for them. Um, or unfortunately, if the, if the refugee claimant gets uh, refused, um, they need to go to the refugee appeal division. And for example, if I get today the negative decision, I have 15 days to send something that is called the notice of appeal, saying, yes, I'm going to appeal. Um, and another 30 days, to uh, sense um, the, the reasons why I believe um, the Refugee Protection Div Division uh, erred when they reject my case. Also, um, the refugee claimants can get legal aid uh, to get the appeal. Um, unfortunately, um, some of them will get legal aid, I think it's three, four hours. Um, and the lawyer, what they are going to do is, is something called um, the legal merit. They need to argue to legal aid why they believe they can win this case. Sometimes legal aid will say, uh, we don't agree with you. And then they don't uh, provide the resources to the lawyer to um, do the conflict appeal. Here at FCJ Refugee Center, we uh, have access to some pro bono students, and they are the ones that uh, when the refugee claimant is rejected by legal aid, we support with appeals. Um, we cannot get too many, but we have been doing this and um, we have been lacking sometimes to get uh, positive decisions. The, the decision can be, um, that the person can be declared protected person or the decision can be saying we are sending back for redetermination and means that the refugee claimant had need, uh, needs to go back for a, a second hearing. Um, if they get it again rejected um, by the appeal division, then they can go to the federal court. And the federal court, again, is 15 days uh, to do the notice of appeal and another 15 days to uh, get um, the, the judicial review completed. Um, many refugee claimants that came through the safety country agreement, unfortunately, they cannot do the first appeal to the refugee appeal division. They can only do the second one, the federal court. That's another issue with the safety country agreement. Um, if they again lose the federal court case, then the last resource for them is the pre-removal risk assessment. But unfortunately, the pre-removal risk assessment, the refugee claimant needs to, the rejected refugee claimant needs to be lucky enough to remain in the country for 12 months. Uh, why 12 months? Um, if CBSA, Canadian Border Services, call the person to be removed, um, they need to see what was the date of the last decision. The last decision can be Refugee Appeal Division or Federal Court. It, it was the Federal Court. Um, if, if it had been 12 months, then they can be invited for pre-removal risk assessment. Um, be, why? Because Canada cannot remove any person if they are going to be uh, put uh, to be tortured or they can risk their life. Unfortunately, the, to get a positive decision with the pre removal risk assessment is very low. It's kind of 3% because um, you need to have new evidence about why you are at risk. And again, they are only considering uh, risk of, uh, of life, nothing else. But after they decide the pre removal risk assessment, the failed refugee claimant cannot be removed. This is the only one that will stop 
removal procedures for a failure refugee claim. Um, recently, uh, Romero House did a research about um, the removal process, and here is the link. They did. Uh, they ended with um, a toolkit. Um, I encourage you to check it out because um, if you have a client that is on the removal process, uh, I know that you are no lawyers, but if you provide this to them, that we they will understand. Of if you get a, a client that says, um, "I was rejected." Um, and now my case is in the refugee appeal, and I don't know when they are going to answer that. Then if you provide this to them, they will understand how the removal process is, what are the things that they can do, and then they can get a lawyer. Um, also, um, the last one of the last remedies for them is the humanitarian and compassion application. Um, in our website, we have um, like a guideline that you can download and provide to the clients. Um, um, this is, um, we have been doing a lot of uh, humanitarian and commercial applications for failure refugee claimants that they are established in the country, that the children arrived, for example, they were 10 years old, now they are 16 to uproot them again is really hard. Um, then the humanitarian compassion is another thing that um, failure refugee claimants or undocumented clients can get it. And if the client had been facing um, mental health issues, um, those reports are really important uh, to provide with a humanitarian and compassion application because sometimes they cannot have access again to a counselor or psychiatric um, support back in the country of origin. Um, who can apply to a humanitarian and compassionate? If they are still doing a refugee claim, they cannot do a humanitarian and compassionate. We have some clients that said, Diana, I have been waiting for years for my hearing. I really, I, I don't want to wait. I want to do a humanitarian. We said, you can not do it because if they, uh, they had to withdraw or abandon the refugee claim. As soon as they withdraw or abandon the refugee claim, they can be removed. Then, and the humanitarian and compassionate uh, will not stop any removal. Then we had to say, and you cannot do a refugee claim and a humanitarian at the same time, unfortunately. Um, uh, uh, also, they need to wait 12 months since the case was rejected or abandoned or withdrawn uh, from the last decision. Um, there is some exemptions to the 12 months bar. And one of the exemptions is if you have children, even if they are back home, uh, that are going to be affected if you are removed from Canada. And the other exemption is if the person is have an illness, if they are going to be removed, the life is going to be at risk then they don't need to wait the 12 months bar to do a humanitarian compassionate. I have children. I was rejected yesterday. My uh, federal court case was rejected. I can do a humanitarian and compassionate at any moment because my children. Um, and the key elements for a humanitarian and compassion, again, are establishment. Then when I see for the first time a refugee claimant, I explain to them the whole process. But I also said, try uh, to fight for your case. Try um, to uh, gather the evidence as, as soon as possible. But also try to uh, do networking, uh, to do volunteer work. Because if you get a positive decision, that networking or that volunteer work uh, can, um, that person that you work with can be your reference for a job, uh, can be your reference to, or, uh, to get housing, or they can be your friends in Canada in the future. But if you get a negative decision, then you have been uh, and you be going to be prepared to do a humanitarian and compassionate. Sometimes I get clients that have been waiting three, four years for, for a decision. At, at last moment, they get rejected and they said, I want to do a humanitarian. What you have been doing? Oh, just working. 
then that's not going to be enough. Then that's why I said, try to do these things. Um, even if your case is really strong, you never know. Um, also, um, we need to see the hardship if they are going back. If, if there is a woman 50 years old, are they, she's going to be able to find a job to survive. Um, also, they need to consider the best interests of the child, even if they were born outside Canada. And uh, we ask them for letters of support from community members, from um, a doctor, a psychologist, a counselor. Those are really important key elements to get a humanitarian and compassion application. And we do those applications for free. Um, because right now, unfortunately, to get a humanitarian and compassionate uh, legal aid can support them. Uh, but um, again, to get a lawyer to do a humanitarian and compassion application through legal aid, these days is very hard. And a private lawyer will last between 7,000 to 9,000 for a family to do a humanitarian and compassion. Um, then these are uh, some resources that uh, refugee claimants can get it. I encourage you to check the refugee hearing preparation. It's really good. Um, and the meet Gary also is, a, is another resource for them. And you can go to our website or encourage the refugee claimants to check our website. We have many resources there um, in many languages and um, they can use it. And I think I will stop here. And um, also you can refer them to, to us if they need uh, anything, any support or they have uh, questions. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> no, thank you so much for speaking to us. This is really great. Yeah. Okay. Take care. Take care.